And there we go. All right, now as you start copying down this slide here, uh, I want to point out that you don't really need the oxygen trivias that are listed here. There's no time that I'm gonna test you on telling me the diameter of an oxygen molecule. Um, there's no time where I'm gonna ask you to tell me how fast it's traveling or how far it travels before it collides with another oxygen molecule. The point of these notes is for us to use something that we all know what it is. We all know what oxygen gas is and use it as an explanation for understanding just how, how non-understandable gases are. Gases are very crazy in what they are capable or how we're capable of manipulating them and then what also effects that they have because of what we call pressure. So uh, that's where we're going with this. Chat to stay open in case you want to include something in here today. Good. All right. So as you copy down this slide, definitely you want to copy down all of this. And I would say instead of copying down the oxygen trivias, why don't you just copy down gas trivias and then you can include very small and mostly empty space as the first two things that we can say in our gas trivias. Uh, yesterday, I was asked the question, why is there a PME hanging out there? That PME hanging out there is because I can never remember things. And kinetic theory is an important thing for, for AP chemistry FRQs. They like to ask, like they'll have an FRQ question that's all based on gases, what you're going to learn in chapter 14. But they tend to end that FRQ with a question that talks about kinetic theory. And so for me to remember the three parts to kinetic, to kinetic theory is that number one, they're made of particles. Number two, that the particles are in motion. And number three, that when the particles collide with each other, for an ideal gas, the collisions are elastic, meaning that they don't stick to each other. So if I'm gonna talk about oxygen trivias though, I needed to have some oxygen molecules out here. I still have my water molecules left over from yesterday. I don't have any oxygen sitting here. I think I had to disassemble in order to make them. So hold on a second. when we're in school together next year, not that we won't be together this year. I think, I still think we will, but we'll already be past this section. So I'm not gonna go back and do this models lab, but uh, you will actually be making these models yourselves using these wooden ball and stick and spring models that we have here. Um, here is what an oxygen molecule looks like as a wooden model. The springs here is our only springs in order for us to be able to bridge the gap at an angle like so, you know, it bows across there to show that Hanafical Bry, that water molecule and water molecules, oxygen molecules are two oxygens in a double bond. We're going to learn about bonding when we get to chapter eight coming up here in a few weeks. Okay, so this is an oxygen molecule. So when we say in number one that the diameter of an oxygen molecule is 0.339 nanometers, we're talking about the distance across here, okay? Now, a nanometer is really small. A meter stick, we know, the meter stick is about that long. A centimeter is about that width. And then a millimeter is like maybe the thickness or maybe a little bit thicker than a pencil lead if you use a mechanical pencil, right? You know that you buy like 0.7 millimeter lead or 0.5 millimeter lead and those kinds of things. So those are numbers that we can see are increasingly getting smaller and smaller. Well, a nanometer is a million times smaller than even that millimeter that we had there, right? Because after you, after you leave, nan, after you leave uh, milli, you go to micrometer, which is a thousand times smaller than a, than a millimeter. Then from micrometer, you go to nanometer, which is a thousand times smaller than that. So a thousand times a thousand is a million times smaller than a millimeter. Okay, so we're talking about this is extremely small. It's so small that we wouldn't be able to go into Mr. Roberto's room and look under a microscope and see a oxygen molecule. We know that if you wanted to have enough oxygen molecules to actually make a gas, that you're gonna need moles of it, right? We know that a mole of it at standard temperature and pressure is gonna occupy the aquarium that you're about to see in a video in a second. All right, so these are very, very small. All right, now, 
kinetic theory says that these are the particles. These particles are constantly in motion. Now, when I move them back and forth like this, they don't stop moving one direction and go the other direction just in space by themselves. What has to happen to get this particle to go back and forth is it has to collide with another one, right? It's like a mosh pit. It's running into another molecule and then bouncing off of it. That's the third part where it says the collisions are elastic. In other words, these don't collide with each other and then stick to each other like this. In a moment, when we deal with water molecules, we're not going to say that. In a moment, we're about to say that the water molecules can stick to each other. Let's wait for that for lesson two. Um, so back to the oxygen molecule. What makes it go back and forth is it's colliding with one on this side. It's colliding with one on this side. So I know what you're all thinking. You're like, well, Mr. Purser, how far do they travel before they collide? Because if I'm ever in a mosh pit, I would say that I only want to travel about maybe half my body length before I collide with somebody because if you're in a mosh pit where you like were able to run across the room and lower your shoulder, that's playing football, right? Running 10 meters and then colliding with somebody, that's not a that's not having fun at a show, right? Your favorite K-pop band, you would never be in that large of a mosh pit, right? Because there's mosh pits at those kinds of bands, right? Is that, is that true? Um, so how far do these travel? All right, well. Here's one water molecule. It's on my table. We'll just put it right there. Okay, so there's that one. Now we need to go 300 times its own diameter. So from here, if I measure this out, one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe about there. Maybe I'm maybe I'm off by a hundred, but uh, could we say that maybe that's how far an oxygen molecule actually travels before it hits another one? So what does it do on its way there? Are there like, uh, um, I, I had my day. Now I'm starting to get a little bit older. So um, I, I try to avoid that because, uh, you know, um, when you get to be my age, every morning you wake up with aches and pains. So getting skanked in the back by somebody, by somebody your age, that's not gonna feel it the next day. It's just not worth it. Um, so uh, where was I at? Oh. So it's going to travel that far. So now your question is, what does the water or what does the oxygen molecule do on its way there? Does it stop on the way there and visit its old friend? Hey, water molecule, what you been up to? Oh, hey, nitrogen molecule, what you been up to? The answer is, it does nothing. There is nothing from here to there. There is a vacuum between those the two oxygen molecules, right? So if I were to try to draw a picture of this. You don't need to copy down this picture. Just listen to my great stories. Here's a container. Pretend that that is a square balloon and there are oxygen molecules inside of this container. What's in between those oxygen molecules is 300 times bigger than the oxygen molecule itself. And it's empty space. It's a vacuum of empty space. So why doesn't this square balloon just collapse down onto itself? because these oxygen molecules are colliding with the balloon and they basically are like pushing it outward at the same time that they also push on each other inward in every direction they're constantly pushing. So now you're thinking, man, that's a lot of pushing. How fast are they moving? Glad you asked, let's go to the next slide. So you're copying down gas trivias, very small, mostly empty space, and then now these two. So how fast are they traveling? they're actually breaking the sound barrier. 1,000 miles per hour, you know, speed of sound is like 760 or something like that in miles per hour. I don't, I don't, do, I don't do English math. Uh, in in uh, metric system, it's 300, at room temperature, it's 343 meters per second. So they're going, in this problem here, I don't know if that's just a, a coincidence or what, but they're going 100 meters per second which is like 220 miles per hour faster than the speed of sound. And look at how fast sound is traveling. You can hear my voice in your living room or bedroom right now, the minute that I make the sound. I know it's the sound traveling turns into an electromagnetic wave that travels at the speed of light, which is like a million times faster than that. And then comes to you back out of sound coming out of the speaker. We need to expand on that. We need to explain that more, but we're gonna have to save that for a, a day in physics class where after we've learned chemistry, we can explain how sound comes from me to you, right? Because it's an incredible, incredible thing that exists naturally, but then also that human beings have learned how to manip 
how to manipulate is just absolutely incredible. But right now we're not there. Right now we're talking about this, this oxygen molecule. So it's traveling so fast that it covers that distance in a fraction of a fraction of a second. And because they're so small, there's so many of them in a given area that the number of collisions that they have with each other, I spelled billion wrong there, didn't I? 4.5 billion collisions per second. If we... Uh, if I'm going to, I'm going to try to see if I can interpret the way your question was written. If you could see them, we wouldn't have light. Exactly. Fortunately, what happens with these, um, let's see, where are we at in our learning this year? We have learned how to ionize, uh, an atom. So I can say this to you, if you have a oxygen, Right, so here's the nucleus and we put eight protons in its nucleus, 8p plus, and then we have the energy levels that are here. So you're getting into too deep of a conversation right now. This is that kind of crazy stuff that just really requires us to be able to sit down and not be on topic and talk about this. Okay, so here's what light does. Okay, I'm going to pick on violet light. Violet light is traveling through the air and it desperately wants to get to your eyes. Right, it's, it's got a love affair with your eyes and it wants to get there. But on the way, it gets blocked by an oxygen molecule. So this oxygen molecule absorbs this violet light. It gets, now who absorbs it is not the entire molecule. Who absorbs that violet light is an electron in one of the energy levels. What that does then is that causes that electron to jump to an excited state that might still be part of the atom, but that excited state exists outside of the valence shell that we all are aware of, right? The valence shell for oxygen is just energy level number two. You know all this stuff. So it jumps to energy level number, I don't care, four, right? Then when it gets up to energy level number four, it's not happy with its situation, so it decides to jump back down. When it jumps back down to the base state that it came from, it gives off exactly how much energy that it absorbed, a violet light ray. Now, is it the exact same photon? No, well, it's energy, right? We're all part of the energy, but that same energy was given off. So Aiden, in answer to your question, if they could be seen in reality would mean that they actually absorbed that light without re-emitting it, then the world would become opaque. We wouldn't be able to see, and there would be no such thing as vision. Living things would never have, have, I'm sorry, this is going to probably offend a few people. Please don't take offense to this. We would never have evolved the proteins required to make eyeballs. What would be the point? So now let's get deeper. If you want to get into some deep philosophy of science, what is a possible, I'm going to call it a sixth sense that we don't possess because the nature around us had no reason for us to develop it. Ooh, that was deep. Didn't that hurt me? Okay. So yes, if we could see the oxygens, then there would be no reason for eyes because of the fact that the light from the sun would never be something that we actually would use as a way to recognize movement. And at some point in time, there were living things that recognized that movement in order to maybe catch something to eat. And then slowly, but that slowly, but surely that, uh, uh, those proteins became more complex and then eventually you have eyesight. Now, please don't take any offense to that because whatever is your belief system can still, that can still fit into your belief system, right? Because something had to create that. So, Hey, believe it. However you want to believe it. I have my belief system too, right? That's the beauty of, of this country is the fact that we all can have a belief system and we all accept each other. And yes, it is absolutely mind blowing. And when we're in school together and we finish a day's notes, these are the kinds of conversations we like to have. That's why you should definitely sign up for one of my classes next year because what other teachers are gonna have a conversation like this with you and know the stuff to talk about, okay? For example, I've got one for, uh, um, 
Miss Abrams in a few minutes, something that you asked me a little while ago is brought up in one of my videos today. So we will talk about that in a second. All right, I think we covered all of that. So why does a gas take up space? Because the particles are moving fast and the particles are colliding a lot and the particles don't stick to each other when they collide with each other. And that gives a gas space. All right, now, I don't know if you know this, but we're surrounded by a whole bunch of gas around us right now. It's mostly nitrogen, but there's also some oxygen and uh, trace other things too, but those are the ones that are main ones. And the earth is pulling on them by gravity. And because of that, they start crowding down to the earth as much as they can. So you should copy down this slide while you copy down the slide, I'm gonna draw a picture of our earth. Let's not make it pink though, let's make it green. It's the earth, we want it to be green, green and blue, right? We'll make the oxygens and nitrogens green and, or make them blue. So you have all of these molecules, here they are, and they're all being pulled on by the earth, right? And as they get pulled down, they get closer and closer and closer and closer and closer and closer and closer to each other so that when you're at the Earth's surface, the number of gas particles that are in close proximity are a lot more than the gas particles that are up high. But if you were to talk about the column of gas particles directly above your head and shoulders, we could be talking about miles and miles and miles, right? I mean, where do you say that uh, the Earth's atmosphere ends and the next sphere begins. Well, that is a hard thing to say because of the fact that the, the amount of air gets thinner and thinner and thinner, right? There's not as many because the ones that are up higher, you know, there's, there's less density there, whatever you want to say. But what I want to say about this is these gas particles now create weight. And whenever you put weight down onto an area, we call that pressure. The basic definition of pressure is force divided by area. You don't need to know that. That's why it's not here in the, in the uh, notes. But the basic understanding of what pressure is, is when you exert a force over an area, okay? So think about like, uh, I don't know, let's pretend that my back hurts. So I'm laying down on my stomach in the middle of the living room and my wife takes her shoes off and stands on my lower back on her bare feet, okay? Her weight, she's about, I don't know, 110 pounds over those two little tiny feet. You know, my wife's feet are size two. Isn't that crazy? Little tiny feet. Um, her two feet on my back is exerting a weight over an area. Now, what happens if she puts on her high heels and stands on my back in the high heels? I'm probably gonna scream in agony and pain, aren't I? The weight didn't change. But what changed is where the area of the pressure is exerted. So pressure has two components to it. It has both the force, but also an area. Now with gases, it's not the same as like a high heel shoe because now you're talking about the fact that they're fluid. They can move around and fill the, fill the void so that they exert a constant pressure in all directions, all right? So there's a, uh, the fluid nature of gases and also liquids too we have this pressure. So how much is it? Well, it turns out that uh, we call it one atmosphere of pressure. That's standard at like beach down at Newport Beach, one atmosphere of pressure. Up here in the high desert, maybe it's like 0.997 atmospheres, basically the same. Now the units, you don't need to copy this down. This is just because somebody asked it after I had put this in the notes yesterday. And so I had to backtrack a little bit. So for you, I'm just doing it in the natural progression. The units of force in physics, we don't use pounds. You wouldn't say 110 pounds. We use something called newtons. A newton is basically, uh, I don't know, the conversion between newtons and pounds is 2.2 pounds is 10 newtons. So whatever you want to say it is, let's say that uh, 110 pounds is uh, 400 and something newtons, okay? Then an area is measured in square meters possibly square centimeters or whatever else. If you take this and group it together, that's called a Pascal, all right? So now the problem is, is because air is so light, it takes a lot of air to make a Pascal. So you'll notice that air pressure is measured in kilopascals or kilopascals, 
that's where this unit comes from. And that's very common in honors chemistry. In AP chemistry, we use all three pretty much interchangeably. So don't get comfortable with any one of them. But in, in honors chemistry, we mostly use, I hope I said that right. In AP chemistry, we use all three interchangeably. In honors chemistry, we almost completely use kilopascals, but they're all the same thing. They're just different numbers, okay? Bigs are pressure. And that brings us to our first thing, which is a barometer. And this is instead of me, I mean, I don't know, it'd probably be more interesting to watch me do it live, but then I got to move the camera around and all of that kind of stuff. And if I even touch the camera cord, it immediately turns my, my video off. So it's just not worth it. So instead I'm going to show you just pieces of the video that I made because the whole video is actually kind of boring. Okay. See, so here's what I'm doing right now. I just jumped right a minute and 38 seconds into a six minute long video because I know your attention spans are only about two minutes long. No, no, uh, no offense uh, should be taken from that. What I've done is I've taken a, a glass container. I think this used to be one of those like, like uh, candle glasses, right? You know, like you put a candle out for, for uh, Catholic holidays or for whatever like that. It's just empty. So it's just an ordinary piece of glass. There's nothing fancy about this. And then I've taken a Petri dish and put it at the bottom of it. Okay. When I let go of the Petri dish, I let go of the Petri dish. There's a good place to stop because now we can see there's no tricks here. At the top is just the bottom of the glass and at the bottom is a Petri dish push there. So why doesn't the water fall out of there? Because the weight of the water, remember back to that formula I just showed you with uh, pressure equals uh, force is weight over area. The force of this water over this much area is less pressure then the entire, exactly, Bill Nye the science guy is the best science ever. We'll get into that in a second. The pressure there is less than the pressure of all of those, I gotta get out of the full screen here. All of those air particles that push in all directions because they're being crowded by each other because gravity is sucking them down to the earth. We don't like the phrase suck though. Science doesn't suck. What science does is science creates areas of low pressure and then higher pressure seeks to fill the void, okay? Bill Nye is the greatest. Uh, it's too bad there's not still shows like that anymore. Uh, when I was in college, I was 22 years old. I remember every day, not every day, it was like Tuesdays and Thursdays. I would, right after my classes ended, I would hurry home in order to sit down on the couch and one of my roommates and I would sit there and watch Bill Nye the Science Guy. And we were idiot college students. Don't think we were nerdy. We weren't nerdy. We were idiots. And yet we couldn't wait to watch Bill Nye the Science Guy every Tuesday and Thursday because that's when we didn't have class. So awesome show. And it'd be nice if they would do something like that again, have somebody else do similar. Okay, back to the video though. So, um, so the gas particles, I can't draw them on this because this isn't a screen for me to draw on. You won't let me do that. But there's gas particles everywhere and they're, in, they're not just pushing down on the aquarium and on your desks around the room. They're also pushing on the bottom of this uh, Petri dish so that the Petri dish doesn't fall off, okay? So then now what I've got here beside this is a big long glass tube. And on one side of this glass tube, I put a rubber stopper and I filled it up with water. The problem is I tried to do the same thing here, but the Petri just fell off, which I knew it would, but it just wastes our time to see it. What I wanted you guys to see was once we flip this over, yeah, see there's where the water fell out of it. Okay, this is the, nope, I'm not quite there yet. Okay, so right, what I did here, I'll start it right there. Filled it up, put my hand over the top of it, and then stuck it down into the aquarium. Okay, I'm not holding, you can even see it's kind of bent over a little bit. Yeah, exactly. It's the bottom of, the, of this glass tube is not pressed against the bottom of the aquarium. 
The bottom of this glass tube is just down inside the water that's in the aquarium, and yet the water doesn't fall out of the tube. So what is our reason for that? Because the air pressure is pushing down on the surface of the water in this aquarium, and then that causes the water molecules to push on each other and exert pressure, and that causes those water molecules then to push on the ones that are inside this tube. And so as long as the pressure of the air pushing on the water is greater than the weight of the fluid in the tube, the tube is going to fill up with water until we go really, really high. In fact, it will actually go through my ceiling. Truth is, we actually would even bore a hole through Mr. Whiteside's ceiling. And once we get to about 30 feet tall, we finally would have a weight of water that would create a pressure equal to the pressure of the atmosphere. So I know your natural question is, well, then what if you made a tube that was 31 meters tall and put it down in that aquarium? What will happen is it will drop down so that where you see, so looking back at the screen again, where you see the water right here would actually drop down one foot inside of there and inside that little gap would be a vacuum. Okay, you have a vacuum inside of there. And then what's neat is we could do little experiments like for example, what if uh, I took my hand away held this up with some kind of like clamp so it would stay upward left the room and then we took all the air out of the room. As we start to I know anytime I come into the room I take all the air out of the room. Um, if we take all the air out of the room, there's no pressure pushing down on the water and we're going to see this tube of water start to empty back down into the aquarium. Okay, so then what happens when I come back in and I fill the room with hot air again and then all of a sudden there's too much pressure. As the pressure goes up, the column will go up higher and so we can raise and lower the column of water in there by how much pressure we exert on it the whole time. Okay. I don't think we need to see anything more on that because it's really nothing more than just me being boring for about another two and a half minutes. So let's go back into our notes. Any questions so far? Good times? That's a barometer. That's what I always get. That's what the question I got yesterday too. Why are there a bunch of random country flags on the back wall over there? Uh, those, let's see, where did it start? I think it started with the blue and yellow flag, which is a, the flag of Sweden. In about 2004, we had an exchange student from Sweden. And so he put the first flag up. And once he put a flag up, then other exchange students added flags. I had hoped that over the course of my career, that wall would be completely covered with flags from different countries. It didn't happen. Um, some of them that were from the same, we got a lot of repeats, right? You get a lot of uh, exchange students that came from Germany, a lot of exchange students that came from Italy. So they didn't bring another flag. They just, some of them signed the flag that was up there. Uh, one of those, the one with the red dot there, that's uh, Bangladesh, Bangladesh, I think, or maybe it was Pakistan. I'm sorry, I don't remember. One of the smartest students I've ever had, a kid named Kabir. Super smart, super smart. I think in fact he's going to graduate school like at Georgetown or Yale or one of those kinds of places now. Um, gosh, I don't even remember where all of them are from, but that, those are the random flags. It's just exchange students that we have. Barometer, good times. Let's keep moving on. Converting between the different measurements that we had there is one of the things you will do in your homework assignment tonight. So if you had 1400 millimeters of mercury and you wanted to convert this to kilopascals or take your 1400 millimeters of mercury and convert that to atmospheres, you will do it the same way you did conversions in chapter, excuse me, get the hiccups, chapters 10 and 12. You will use a conversion table. And like all conversion tables, you know that if you're given one unit, that in the next line, you get out of that unit. And then with these, what's nice about these, these are just one or two step conversion tables, put your given and then do your conversion, um, that you will go straight into the answer units. But what you need is a conversion between kilopascals and millimeter. Oh, that's what I was gonna say about the barometers is nobody, you were too busy looking at the flags and talking about Bill Nye to say to me, well, I've heard of a barometer, but I've never seen a tube that was 30 meters tall. What do you do instead? Use mercury. Mercury makes a much better barometer for a couple of reasons. One of them is mercury is so heavy that you only need to have a, a barometer that is 
760 millimeters tall. That's actually the height of that glass tube that you saw in the video. It's actually 80 centimeters tall. So therefore, if I were to fill that with mercury and stick it down into a mercury pool, it would drop four centimeters inside of there and have a perfect vacuum inside that space. That would be a mercury barometer. We can't do that because I'm not sticking my hand into an aquarium full of mercury. And plus I probably would get the school like a huge fine for having that much mercury anyway. It's probably illegal. But that's millimeters of mercury, which is also sometimes referred to as TOR, but we don't use that term in this year. We wait till AP chemistry to use that term and then we'll worry about it then. 760 millimeters of mercury is one standard atmosphere and it happens to be 101.3 kilopascals. And for those of you who like to keep track of units, millimeters of mercury cancels out. And now we have kilopascals. And my calculator tells me 186.6. But of course, Mr. Purser being that jerk that he is, grades significant digits. So if this only has two significant digits, I'm going to round this number to 190 so that it also only has two significant digits. Likewise, if you would like to get out of millimeters of mercury, and get into atmospheres, one standard atmosphere is 760 millimeters of mercury. And now you have successfully gotten out of one unit and into the other. We do the division and the calculator tells us 1.84, which of course with two significant digits, we'll round that to 1.8. random things on my wall. You, so wait till you're in this room and you're going to go, wow, there is a bunch of random things on the wall. Like for example, why is there a hand sticking out of the wall with a roll of toilet paper on there? You want to be random? That's random. Temperature. Hey, remember, this is only the first of today's notes. We're going to do a second section here. So don't get all excited because you see chapter 13 homework number one means that we're done. We're just done with day one. So let's hurry through it. How does a thermometer work? Okay, so now what a thermometer is. Now I'm gonna pick on red alcohol thermometers because those are the ones that we use in class. And I'll explain the other ones too. While you're copying this down, hopefully that you're listening so that you can understand this. The reason why we wanna use red alcohol thermometers is number one, they're not mercury, so they're not dangerous, but both mercury and red alcohol do the same premise. And that is that when you warm them up, everything expands How's it going, Alan? Good to see you there for a moment. Um, everything expands, and as they expand, the liquid is expanding at about 50 times faster than the glass tube is. And so the liquid has nowhere to go but up that really thin tube. And it turns out that human beings figured out that the expansion was linear, meaning that if you heat it up this much, it goes up this much, right? Heat it up by 10 degrees, it goes up by one centimeter. Heat it up by 20 degrees, it goes up by two centimeters. Heat it up until if you put it in water and it's at 100 degrees Celsius, of course they didn't know that at the time, but the water is boiling, it always goes up to this line. So somebody said, hey, let's put a mark there. And then somebody else said, let's label that mark 100. Then let's go and stick it into ice water, right as the water's about to completely freeze over, what does the thermometer read? Or what does the level drop down to? Right? The red alcohol doesn't freeze because it freezes at a lower temperature than water does. So it'll drop down to a certain volume. They put a line there. So let's call that zero. And now you have a, a centigrade or Celsius thermometer. Okay. Now, that then brought the, like, the uh, likely extrapolation from that is, well, how, how if, if particles are moving, right? Remember, we talked about this as moving. Okay, it's recognized by kinetic theory that if you heat something up, the particles are moving faster. It's like a mosh pit where the temperature inside the room is getting really, really hot. But everybody's moving faster. Because of that, it takes up more space. Then as they move slower, they take up less space. So what happens when you slow them down to the point where they don't move at all? They take up no space. So what temperature corresponds to no space taken up. We do this as a lab and we might even try to do this as an at-home lab. 
Now, I guarantee you don't have the ability to get to absolute zero, but you have the you have the ability to graph data points and then see if the extrapolation from your graph, in other words, follow the straight line, see if it points to absolute zero at negative 273 degrees Celsius. We do that in class, but you can do that at home. We'll try to put up a lab for that. The only problem is you're going to need a, a balloon and not pop it. So I'm, I'm hoping that you have balloons. If not, we're going to have to figure something out there. While you're copying that down, do you want me to tell you some uh, more things about um, the past and the future? First of all, we need to say one more thing here because this is what's important for you for your tests is if you put the temperatures in Kelvin, what's nice then is that we can use Kelvin temperatures to talk about kinetic energy. They're directly related. Celsius and Fahrenheit don't work this way, but Kelvin does. If you double the Kelvin temperature, you double the amount of kinetic energy of the particles. So if this particle here is at one Kelvin, if you change its temperature to two Kelvin, it's gonna have double the kinetic energy. If you change it to three Kelvin, it's gonna have triple the kinetic energy and so on and so forth. So that's why Kelvin is, one of the reasons why Kelvin is a better temperature scale. Now, outer space between two and four Kelvin. Did you know that we could say that at the time of the Big Bang that outer space at that singularity was at billions of Kelvin. I don't know what it exactly was. Maybe I know, you know, who knows? Google, Google knows. Temperature of the big bang. Google says 1000 trillion degrees Celsius. Hey, that looks like a nice picture right there. Can we see it in big time? Ah, it's part of a, a thing here, but you could always look this up yourself and, and read about it. Um, anyway, it took 380,000 years for the temperature of the universe by expansion. Okay, so here's something that we learn in physics. I'm, so I'm getting a little bit off topic, even though it's totally on topic. What we learn in physics is, have you ever like, okay, we'll pick on Bobby. Bobby, have you ever been playing baseball and you didn't put your mitt on and somebody hits the ball and you catch it with your bare hand and it stings like nothing else? There's nothing worse than that pain from when your hands sting. And what do you do when your hands sting? You go, <laughs> right? And then you go, <laughs> you blow on your fingers and your fingers, <laughs> it feels cold. Yet if you were to <sighs> blow on your hand with your actual, <laughs> cry a little bit, exactly. If you blow on your hand with your mouth open, your breath feels warm, but if you blow on your hand with your, with your lips puckered, it feels cool. You all know it. You know it's a true statement. So what's the reason for this? It turns out that when gases come out of a container and are able to expand outward, they can't collide with each other as well. And because of the fact that they're moving away, they lose this movement of kinetic energy such that their temperature, their overall temperature becomes less. So after the singularity explosion and things are expanding outward, the universe is cooling at a rapid, rapid rate. It's cooling to the point that now we're at the point 13.8 billion years later that we're at down to two to four Kelvin from that 1,000 trillion degrees that it started at. Isn't that crazy? So. Here's some other crazy things. Light couldn't exist in the universe until 380,000 years. And the reason for this is because it required the universe to cool down enough that the first electron, remember the picture from earlier today? Let's go back to this picture because you guys are having fun, right? Remember this picture? You can't have a photon of light until one of these electrons drops down onto an atom, then it can release a photon. And if that photon happens to be in the visible light range, then it becomes visible light. So the first photons of visible light couldn't exist until the universe cooled enough in order for that electron 
to transition in a way that gives off a visible photon of light. And it is theorized that that was 380,000 years after the Big Bang. Now, is any of this stuff real? I have no idea. All I know is it sure is interesting, isn't it? Isn't it just kind of interesting to learn some of this kind of stuff? Even You don't have to believe it. It's not going to affect you on your tests or anything, right? But it makes for very interesting science. All right. That takes care of the first day's notes. I don't think there's anything I didn't cover on here. So I think we're good. That's how short the first assignment is. Let's go to the second one and get through it. And then you have another very short assignment that goes with it as well. Good times. All right, this homework assignment, don't look at it. Don't look, don't look at the answers. No screenshotting, don't stop. Do the homework yourself. Don't just copy it. There you go. Now we're gonna look at liquids. So now we have to get rid of my oxygen molecule and we have to look at our water molecule. Now this is my preferred water molecule because it looks a little bit more like that Mickey Mouse head than the one I'm about to make using the springs. The unfortunate thing is I only have one size spring. So therefore it makes my water molecule look like poor Mickey Mouse got deformed, right? Got some disease of the ears causing the ears to stick out too far. But why I like this water molecule is because I can do this. And what I like about this is I can, you can see that. What I like about this is that later on this year, I can tell you when a water molecule does this, you can't tell. What does that mean? When a water molecule does this, you can tell. But when a water molecule does this, you can't tell. When a water molecule does this, you can't tell. When a water molecule does this without breaking off, back and forth like that, you can't tell. What does that mean, Mr. Purser? What are you talking about? I mean that when tonight you go and you turn the shower on and you turn that little dial over to hot and you step in there and you're like, oh, all my aches and pains are going away. What's happening is you've got water molecules that are at a temperature probably around 38, 39 degrees Celsius. They've got that much kinetic energy, okay? And when they collide with your body, they pass that kinetic energy over to your body and your body recognizes it as heat, okay? But water molecules have a tremendous ability to store energy inside the movement of the ears too. And this does not translate into warming you up. So why do we care? because I ate my oatmeal this morning. And you know how long it took for me to wait for that water to boil, right? So if we could make oatmeal with something other than water molecules, it wouldn't take so long. Water takes a tremendously long time to heat up because it takes a lot of energy because some of the energy gets trapped in the ears rather than just moving like this. Think about putting the, the pan on the, on the stove without putting any water in it you know that if you go over there and touch it, it's going to burn you. So metals have a tremendous ability to turn all of the energy into movement, into kinetic energy, whereas non-metals have the ability to sometimes absorb it a little bit in other ways because of the covalent bonding. But we haven't talked about that yet because that's chapter seven and eight. That's coming up. Yes, Jessica, they are mildly entertaining to play with in class. And so therefore, next year in AP Chemistry, they're all yours, right? Okay. Now, all the stuff I just told you was just killing time while you were copying down the, the notes here, because we need to talk about what makes a what, what makes a liquid different than a gas. Watch this. You ready? Here's a gas. That's a gas. Here's a liquid. All right? You see the difference there? The fact that in a liquid, you now have slowed the particles down enough. Their kinetic energy is a little bit less, right? They're cooler so that the particles will actually stick to each other possibly. So this is a strong bond between an oxygen and a hydrogen, but you know what? The bond between a different Mickey Mouse head to this oxygen is also kind of strong, not nearly as strong as this one, but still got some strength that actually it's gonna take at least 100 degrees Celsius to get these to completely break apart from each other and form a gas. Now, what does that mean? Well, to form a gas means that they have enough pressure that when they collide with each other, they can't stick to each other. So really what we're doing here in section two is talking about how we got to combat section one, because that stupid air pressure 
is what prevents us from turning these into these, right? That's basically what's going on. And that's what it says there in the bullets. They don't have enough kinetic energy to be completely free of each other because they're not moving quite fast enough. So where can we go with that? Those of you who are sitting there going, I'm not bored, I'm having a great time. But what about Mr. Purser, the fact that I know that if you leave your teacup sitting on the table here for the, uh, till we meet again on Friday, that when you go and look down inside of there, right now it's half full of tea right to here, that on Friday it will probably be empty. At least it'll be close to empty. So if the particles don't have enough, yes, you have to do two homework assignments. Um, so if the particles don't have enough kinetic energy to break completely free of each other, why did the water evaporate? And the answer is because when we say that the temperature corresponds to a kinetic energy, it's actually corresponds to an average kinetic energy, meaning that some have it and some don't, but on average, they all don't. Okay. So when they're colliding with each other, they pass energy back and forth, right? Every, or maybe even they stick to each other as they're kind of bumping into each other and so on and so forth. Every once in a while, one of them has enough kinetic energy. And if it's close to the surface of the liquid, it leaves. It evaporated. So evaporation occurs at the surface of the liquid, like the first bullet point says. Okay. Now, who just left? The fast one. Who was left behind? The slow one. So if the fast one and the slow one average together to be whatever the temperature is, and you take away the fast one, by averages, you would say that the slow one means that the temperature is lower. Anybody ever notice what happens to you in summertime when you go out and play baseball or you go running? You sweat. What is sweating? Sweating is bringing a liquid to the surface of your skin so that it can evaporate away. There's a great book out there called Born to Run. And... Basically, what the premise of the book is, is that human beings were born to run. In other words, we have evolved the ability to run long distances because I don't know if you guys know this, but um, it is theorized that the, the first primates to come. I know it's getting into a lot of crazy E word stuff today. Remember, don't be offended by anything. You don't have to believe what you don't want to believe. It's not going to affect your test questions, but it's interesting how the chemistry behind all of this fits everything else. The first primates to come out of the trees were in an area like Northeast Africa, where there was really bad drought for thousands, I don't know if there's thousands of years or whatever it was. And so at some point in time, they must have picked up the, uh, the ability to be omnivorous rather than to just be eating the, the herbivores, right? I don't know. I don't know how all that works. I'm not a biologist. But at some point in time, they decided, I'd like to eat that gazelle, right? It's like a deer. But the problem is the deer's a lot faster, right? And this is before there was, we had the technology of weapons other than maybe like, you know, sticks and knives and stuff like that. So how do you chase down a gazelle when you're hungry? You run it down. So you run after it. It runs to the next hill and stands over there. You keep going towards it and it runs again and you do it 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 again. And then about five miles down the road, the gazelle finally goes, I give up. Human wins, right? So how did the human be able to run all that distance? Because we can sweat. And the minute that we have the ability to sweat, we now have the ability to cool ourselves down so that we can maintain that chemistry that's going on in the muscles that creates a lot of heat for a lot longer time. Okay. I don't know what OP means, but I'll agree with you. So overpowered. <laughs> so I don't even know what that means, but it doesn't matter. Uh, so that's evaporation occurs at the surface. So now you're sitting there going, but then it gets cooler. So evaporation is a cooling process. That makes sense. It cools us down. What about boiling? Turns out that boiling is also a cooling process. So not just evaporation, but boiling. Oh, oh very strong. Very nice. True. Very true. And, and it's also important. I think that one of the things that we've done in, in more current times of history is we've looked at sweating as like a bad thing, right? It's like the last thing you want to see is me with big old like armpit rings right now. But, you know, I don't care because even though I don't have them because I'm just sitting in a chair, but if you were in class, I'd be running around doing cartwheels. I might have some armpit rings. Well, it's natural. So we're supposed to do. Human beings are supposed to sweat. 
we spend too much time indoors now because we can. And if that's what you need to do, fine. But I still think that it's very healthy, good for the mind to get outside and do some exercise. Play in the dirt. Now, I just said something to you and you took it with nobody throwing anything into the chat. I just said to you that boiling water is a cooling process. So you put a thermometer down into a beaker of boiling water and you look at the thermometer waiting for it to cool and it doesn't, it stays at the temperature. Why? Why doesn't it cool? I gave extra credit yesterday for somebody answering this. Why does the beaker of boiling water not get cooler? Did you guys see that tumbleweed just go by? Come on, somebody out there can tell me, why doesn't a beaker of boiling water get cooler? If boiling is a cooling process, just like evaporation is a cooling process. You can put it privately. I won't, I won't rat you out. I won't put you on blast. Very good. Do you care if I say that you got it right? Thank you. Joseph said, because there's a heat source underneath it. So what's happening is when you're warming up, you have it on the hot plate. I said that first, but I didn't include those words after that. You have it on the hot plate. So what you're doing is you're putting heat energy into these water molecules and causing this to break apart first. It doesn't break these, but it breaks this apart first. Now this one, even if it's near the bottom of the beaker, it's got too much kinetic energy to reattach to anybody else. And as a bubble, it rises to the surface and escapes from the liquid. We call that boiling rather than evaporation, which occurs just at the surface of the liquid, okay? Now, when this one leaves, the one that's left behind is cooler, but we're continuing to heat it. There is still a heat source underneath. Let me go to the next slide while I go and uh, put a couple points of extra credit down for Joseph. Wrong papers. So, I know what you guys are all wondering. How can we manipulate that? Done? How can we manipulate that? If I ask you this question, anytime, if I ask you this question on your next chapter test, what is the boiling point of water? I do not want you to put on there, please, for, for goodness sake, do not put on there 212 degrees Fahrenheit. We never talk in American money in this class. Everything is the metric system in here. So 212, forget about that. Now, if you put on your test 100 degrees Celsius or 373 Kelvin, you're still gonna get it wrong. If I ask you, what is the boiling point of water? You're always going to tell me the answer for any time I see you for the rest of your life. If I run into you at the grocery store or at the brewery and I say, hey, hey what's up? What's the boiling point of water? You're always gonna to say to me, it depends. What's the boiling point of water? It depends. So for example, I have a flask here with a rubber stopper in it. I can't do this as a demonstration because I don't want to get hurt, but I have a flask here with a rubber stopper in it. And I put this on a hot plate. Now, even before I put it on the hot plate, so let's not put it on the hot plate yet. Let's just start by saying there's water molecules down inside of here, little Mickey Mouse heads, and they're colliding with each other. As they collide with each other, every once in a while, one of them close to the surface gets enough kinetic energy and breaks free from the rest of them and becomes a gas particle. And then another one does it, breaks free, becomes a gas particle. And then another one breaks free, becomes a gas particle. And then another one, and then another one. And guess what? You're right, another one. And then another one. Eventually, there's so many up here, they're colliding with each other. As they collide with each other, every once in a while, one of them in the collision doesn't have enough kinetic energy to maintain the gas state. And if it happens to be too close to the surface of the liquid, it crashes right into the liquid and becomes part of the liquid again. So if you get enough of them in the gas state, the rate that they evaporate and the rate that they turn back into a liquid condense becomes equal rate. We call that dynamic equilibrium these are supposed to be O's, not zeros. So whoever made this slide for me and I didn't notice, H2O's, not H2 zeros. You get to this dynamic equilibrium, okay? 
So condensation and evaporation occurring at the same time. So now we only put this on the hot plate. When you put this on the hot plate, you're gonna cause more of them to evaporate at a faster rate than the ones that are condensing. And so you're gonna build up even more pressure of water molecules as they get hotter and hotter. So let's label this hot plate down here. So at what point do they start to what we would call boil? How do you get a water molecule located close to where the hot plate is to turn into a gas? You've got to give it more kinetic energy than the weight of everything around it collapsing it. So this little tiny particle here is trying to form a bubble. And if it doesn't have enough kinetic energy, the weight of the air on top of it and the weight of the fluid on it are gonna collapse it back into a liquid state again, okay? It tries to break free of everybody and then gets forced right back into staying a liquid. So not until you get it hot enough will it finally break free and form a gas, okay? Once it does, then that little bubble is going to rise to the surface and another water molecule escapes. But we've got this in a closed container. Okay, so maybe we should start without using a closed container. Let's just put this in a beaker on the hot plate, all your water molecules. When they escape, there's nothing to stop them, right? When they escape, they leave the beaker. So what kind of pressure is above this beaker? It's just regular old air. So these guys can form a bubble when they have the kinetic energy that matches atmospheric pressure. Their vapor pressure has to equal atmospheric pressure. Are you hearing me? Can I get an amen, all right? When their kinetic energy gives them enough pressure pushing away from everybody that they can fight the atmosphere, they form a bubble and they leave. That happens to be at 100 degrees Celsius is where water molecules have enough kinetic energy. And I know you're sitting there going, my gosh, how does it be exactly 100? Why isn't it like 99.3 or 107.6 or something like that? Because a human being chose that number to be the temperature. Water was already boiling long before we ever recognized the chemistry of what was going on, right? It didn't just start boiling at 100 degrees Celsius because we decided 100 degrees Celsius was the boiling temperature of water. We picked that number. Somebody with the last name Celsius, I'm guessing, picked that number. Good times, right? So you put a rubber stopper on top of the flask and those particles start escaping, evaporating until you build up pressure in there. Would it make sense that now it might require more than 100 degrees Celsius to get those water molecules to turn into a gas. You ever heard of a pressure cooker? That's the whole point of a pressure cooker. You put the lid down tight and then you create pressure inside of there so that the water doesn't boil until it hits like 110 degrees Celsius or 120. Why would you wanna do that? Because you know how much better pasta tastes when it's cooked at a higher temperature? You can't put it in the oven because pasta doesn't taste good when it's baked. Pasta tastes good when it's boiled. So if you could boil at a higher temperature, you get better pasta, right? So a pressure cooker is taking advantage of that fact that we can raise the boiling temperature by exerting a higher vapor pressure on it. Great times. We're almost done because now you guys are thinking, well, let's do the reverse. If Mr. Purser says that the boiling temperature water depends and so far, he's only taught us how to make the boiling temperature be higher than 100 degrees. Is there a way for us to make the boiling temperature of water lower than 100 degrees? I take you to the internet. Now, here's the problem. I could show you my video, all right? I don't even know, right here, it's, here it is right here. Six and a half minutes long. And it's just a super boring job. You know why? Because I'm not a YouTuber. I'm just, it's just not in my wheelhouse. So how about instead we watch a YouTuber do this? And also I will speed it up because their video is like 12 minutes long. How about if we can do this where we can have the video just be like about four minutes long? But I can't, there you go. The toolbar is in the way. There we go. Okay, so here's this guy. I'm going to call this a tweaker. Now, when I use the phrase tweaker with you guys for the next two and a half years, I don't want you ever to be offended by that. I don't want you ever to think that I'm talking about somebody who does drugs, because I'm not. The term tweaker is a person who likes to play with science. The reason why some tweakers do drugs is because the problem is, is the tweakers that do like methamphetamine, they can't sleep. And because they can't sleep, 
they run out of stuff to do because video games are only so fun. Movies are only so fun. Eventually you go, I wonder how the phone works. I'm going to take it apart, right? So that's what a tweaker became is a, is a person that was part of the a, a drug culture. But that's not the true tweakers. The true tweakers are the people who in their own garage make their own vacuum chamber out of a old, I'm assuming it's a, um, a wash machine. I don't know. It's probably not. It's probably actually high tech stuff. But anyway, this guy has a, a vacuum chamber here. And I'm going to skip forward to, if it'll let me, three minutes in. Okay, so here's what we got going on inside of here so that you know what you're seeing here. He's got a, I'm pointing with my fingers again, you can't see that. It's pointing to it. All right, so what he's got inside of here is a beaker of water. Okay, inside the water, he's put some little tiny like crystals, not like crystals that will dissolve, but crystals that will actually be a place for the water to boil off of so it doesn't spatter all over the place and make a mess. He's got a thermometer. We can't read the thermometer right now, but I believe that what it said earlier was like around 17 degrees Celsius, which is just slightly colder than what comes out of the tap. A timer, a, ther a thermometer in the background that tells us the temperature inside the vacuum chamber is not cold. 60 degrees Celsius is like room temperature right now, okay? Then, um, it's on top of like the stuff that your Nike shoes come in, that absorbent pack, so that any water that comes out, he's trying to absorb that out of the way as quickly as possible. And then out in front here, this is a little miniature barometer. And so as the barometric pressure increases, we're going to see this tube go higher and higher and higher, and this tube goes lower and lower and lower. We'll let him describe all of that. And then in the process of it, Andrea, if you're still listening, I've got something for you. He could be a chemistry teacher. That's why I'm showing you this video and not mine. Theoretically, which is actually going to become a reality, he can boil this water until it continues to boil until it freezes over on the top. And it will if you keep watching the video. There it was, Andrea. Did you hear it? You asked me the question, how do fish breathe? If I don't see your name pop up in the chat, I'm not going to discuss any more about how fish breathe until somebody wants to know. But first thing that happens is dissolved air inside of the water leaves. Notice the temperature, 17 degrees Celsius. That's cold. That's slightly below room temperature. You wash your hands in it and that's about it. And the water's starting to boil. Why is the water starting to boil? Because even though these particles aren't moving very fast, they don't have to push up against a high atmosphere because we're taking the atmosphere out of the chamber, the water starts to boil. Do you hear him? I mean, he's saying exactly what I just said to you, but he's also got a great YouTube video for it. The reason the water is boiling is not because it's at 100 degrees Celsius. The water is boiling because you took away the pressure pushing on the top of the liquid. And so now even at, now he's probably down to about 10 degrees Celsius. At 10 degrees Celsius, the water has enough kinetic energy to overcome that very, very low vapor pressure because there's no atmosphere inside the vacuum pump. Oh, 16. I was wrong, sorry. Even though the water's boiling, 
it's actually getting colder. Hey, Mr. Purser, what temperature does water boil at? It depends. If you take away atmospheric pressure, it'll boil at 15 degrees Celsius. Did you hear that? Atmospheric pressure we just said in the classroom is 760 millimeters. He's down to a uh, pressure inside that chamber of 10 millimeters. Think about the difference, 760 compared to 10, quite a bit lower pressure. Can you see the ice crystals? That's a really good vacuum. My vacuum chamber can't make that much of a vacuum. Zero point two degrees. It was boiling. There it was. You just watched water boil until an ice cube formed. Don't you feel like you're a better person now? All right, let's get you out of these notes. What do we have left to say? Here is the last slide. And then your homework assignment tonight is this. That's just four more questions, but let's get this last slide on here. Now, if I ask you what is the normal boiling point of water, now you can tell me that it's 100 degrees Celsius at standard atmospheric pressure. But otherwise, if I ask you what's the boiling point, you have to tell me, Mr. Purser, it depends. It depends on the pressure. Here is a line that represents the boiling temperature of water right here. And what you guys just saw, really technically this line shouldn't go all the way back to here because water stops being liquid at about this point right there. But notice that our friend in that video, I owe him a fortune. That person was able to lower the vapor pressure, the atmospheric pressure inside of his vacuum chamber down to almost a near perfect vacuum. And so the water continued to boil until the water hit the temperature of 32 degrees Celsius or 32 Fahrenheit, which we, no, no, we do want to go to zero. See, I'm already thinking in American money. Jeez, let's try that again. Too excited about the problem. This can go all the way down to zero. And that's where it goes to close to a perfect vacuum. Now I'm saying things correctly. Um, and the water was still, the wa liquid part was still boiling until it formed an ice shield on the top of it and then it couldn't boil anymore because the ice was in the way. Good times? As soon as you are done copying this down, you can start filing yourself out of the Zoom. If you've got anything you need to ask me about here, throw it in the chat so I know not to uh, close this off too early. I am gonna stop the record though. I'll put the share back on.